Welcome everyone. We'll wait just a minute or two more for folks to arrive. I'll turn it on. Always interesting, this virtual waiting room. So like we're all in our places with bright, shiny faces or something like that? We are, I think that's the saying. And we all have sweatshirts on. <laughs> that is true of a snowing here in Iowa, for those of you who aren't oh, in Iowa. I didn't see the snow. Oh, I should have come to Cresco. I live a half an hour away from where the actual office is that this event will be. It'll get better. <laughs> Couple minutes have passed. Well, I'll start. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our panel discussion tonight. Uh, for some of you joining us for the very first time, my name is Charlene Bohr. I'm the director of Northeast Iowa Peace and Justice Center. Uh, we're a small nonprofit based out of Decorah, Iowa. Uh, we create initiatives to promote peace, human rights, local resilience, and social and environmental justice. I invite you to check out our website and uh, sign up for our newsletter. We also ask that if you are able, if you could please make a donation to support our programming tonight. I'll drop a link into the chat and uh, we'll th we thank you for sure for your generosity. Um, let me just do that here. There you go, a link right there. And uh, just now a little bit about logistics for tonight. We invite you all to keep yourselves muted for the discussion, keeps any sound glitches at bay. There'll be time for questions and answers at the end of the discussion, and you'll be welcome to raise your hands virtually uh, via Zoom and ask your questions. Or for those of you who prefer to drop questions into the chat as the evening progresses, uh, we can, we'll be able to ask those uh, to the panelists when the time comes. Also to let you know, tonight's event is being recorded to allow for future ver viewing and will be accessible on Peace and Justice's YouTube channel. And now I'll to introduce and turn things over to our intern, Vanalika Nargawala. Thank you again, all of you for coming tonight and a very special thank you to our panelists and our moderator for your time and expertise this evening. Hello everyone, thank you so much for making it tonight. It is a complete honor and privilege to introduce the lovely panelists that we have here tonight. I would like to firstly introduce our moderator for the evening, Professor Susan. She's an assistant professor of social, social work and field director of Luther College, Decorah, Iowa. She has also taught at the College of St. Scholastica, St. Catherine University and Our Lady of the Lake University. She was a senior research consultant and co-author for the UNHCR report, Children on the Run, Unaccompanied Children Leaving Central America and Mexico and the Need for International Protection and Research. She's also the coordinator and co-author for the US report of the Seeking Asylum Alone Project. She has also been a consultant with the Young Center for Immigrant Services. Uh, and this is specifically at the University of Chicago and also with Lutheran Immigration Refugee Services. She was previously serving as the director of the Children's Services at LERS. Professor Susan has a, has a doctorate from St. Catherine University and St. Thomas of Sco School of Social Work and has a master's degree from Columbia University School of Social Work and Boston University School for Theology. Our next panelist I would like to introduce is Mr. Jean. 
Hi, it's Mr. Jean Steve. He's currently an admissions and university counselor at Grand Canyon University in Arizona. He received his master's degree in public administration at Grand Canyon University. He is also a motivational and inspirational speaker who loves to spread awareness on the importance of supporting immigration. Jean shares his story of seeking asylum in America from Burundi and East Africa in 2014, completely alone. And he um, created a life for himself away from unsafety and human rights violations he was surrounded at with home. He arrived in Tuscan with $187 and a briefcase, working minimum wage, and is now being able to bring his family to the United States while also going through the immigration process. His story is absolutely compelling and has provided so many people hope and understanding. So we thank you for coming. Our next panelist is Dr. Yinka. She's a licensed psychologist who is originally from Sierra Leone. She is a board certified in group psychology by the American Board of Professional Psychology. Dr. Yinka is a tenured professor in the Department of Psychology at City College of New York, the City University of New York, and the Graduate Center, CUNY. She has cared for forced migrants as well as survivors of torture, armed conflict, and human rights abuses from around the world at the Bellevue Program for Survivors of Torture since 1999. She's also a co-founder for a nonprofit organization that was created to proactively respond to war survivors from the African diaspora. The name of the organization is in the language Creo, which translates to It Belongs to Us. Um, if possible, Dr. Yinka, would you mind pronouncing the name of the organization for our reference? Now we own. Now we own. Um, and Dr. Yinka has also uh, participated in human rights investigations in Sierra Leone, which included serving as a joint expert on gender crimes and post-traumatic stress disorder for the international criminal courts, as well as Dr. Yinka has worked in developing and examining mental health interventions in Sierra Leone, um, continuing to also talk about workshops and conduct workshops addressing the importance of self-care for mental health service providers nationally as well as internationally. Thank you for making it tonight. Uh, our last uh, guest is Ms. Nisha Kuroop. She is working for the Intercultural Mutual Assistance Association as a Victim Services Program Manager in Rochester, Minnesota. The Victim Services Program in IMMA uh, builds bridges for safety and hope by providing culturally sensitive bilingual direct service to immigrant and refugee victims of crime. She's a licensed social worker by profession and has worked with several years of experience in India before immigrating to the United States. She's a pillar in building IMMA to what it is today with the creation of several connections to better support immigrant victims in Minnesota, specifically Rochester. Thank you so much for making it and I'll take it away and give it to Professor Susan. <laughs> Thank you, Vanu, for all your hard work uh, in pulling things together, and Charlene as well. Uh, we appreciate your efforts in Decora and beyond. And thank you to our panelists for making time. Uh, we hear even during a spring break, so we appreciate that. And I just wanted to say our our panelists tonight uh, will help us consider the difficult and traumatic experiences that can be part of the migration experience and process, whether before, during, or after migration occurs. And hearing these stories can help to humanize the policy debates that we hear in the news. Uh, it can help us as professionals in working sensitively with those that we encounter in our work. And it can help us as neighbors and friends to those who are in our communities. Uh, to kind of set the stage for some of the things we'll be talking about, I just wanted to open with a couple of definitions. The term refugee comes from the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees. Uh, and it is part of US law. The definition is a well-founded fear of persecution on uh, one of five grounds, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or particular social group. And uh, in the US context, someone who is a refugee has received refugee status before they enter the United States. An asylum seeker is someone seeking refugee protection after they arrive in the United States. 
And uh, we might keep in mind that if there is no refugee processing in someone's country, there's no other way to enter the US except as an asylum seeker and to seek that protection after they arrive. Uh, the terms undocumented or unauthorized refer to someone who is residing in a country without legal documentation. And this can include someone who comes with a visa and stays longer than that visa is valid or who comes seeking work or who comes seeking asylum and that status has not been granted yet. So someone might start out as uh, being undocumented and eventually have a way to uh, get permanent legal status. I also thought I'd mention the model written about by a scholar named Diane Drachman. And she talks about the stages of migration as pre-migration, transit, and resettlement. And this is also helpful for us to think about in relation to trauma because traumatic events can happen at any of those stages. It can be part of a reason that someone leaves and decides to migrate to another country. It can occur during that migration experience, during that transit experience, and also after they've reached what might otherwise seem to be safety. So I'll, with that, I'll open a question um, to Dr. Yinka to start. When we think about immigrant trauma, what does that mean in your context? So I'd like to start, first of all, by thanking the Northeast Iowa Peace and Justice Center for doing me the honor um, of an invitation to participate in this event. You know, I'm, this panel is amazing. Vanu, thank you for reaching out to me so persistently. Having said this, I bring you greetings from my colleagues and our clients at the Bellevue Program for Survivors of Torture based in New York City. And these are people that I've had the privilege of working with and for since 1999, as was mentioned. Our program is located in Bellevue Hospital Center. You probably don't know this, but our hospital, Bellevue Hospital Center, was founded on March 31st, 1736. It is the nation's oldest public hospital. So our program provides, has been around since 1995, and we have provided direct services in the form of medical, mental health, social, legal services for refugees, asylees, asylum seekers, and undocumented people, men, women, and children from all around the world who come to New York, New York City specifically, fleeing human rights abuses, armed conflict, and torture. And we engage in service provision, research, education, and advocacy. Since we started, uh, our program has provided services to help rebuild the lives of over 600, sorry, 6,500 women, children from over 112 countries. And we provide our services regardless of ability to pay. Um, so our, our approach has really been around working with survivors. Um, seeing them as having resources and, the, and assets that have enabled them to survive what they've been through. Uh, and we draw on a culturally sensitive approach, but these are people who come fleeing all kinds of, um, you know, trauma, traumatic events that have impacted them physically, emotionally, and socially. Thank you. And a little closer to home, uh, Nisha, can you tell us what trauma, when we think about trauma, what does that look like in your context at IMAA? I think I was muted. Uh, first of all, thank you, Vanalika, to, you know, for introducing me to this group and Charlene and Susan and Yinka, Yinka and uh, Jean. It's been nice uh, to work together in this uh, panel. Um, talking about uh, IMAA, Intercultural Mutual Assistance Association. So uh, we have been in um, the serving Southeast Minnesota specifically 
in Olmsted County specifically for over um, 30 years. It started 1984. Uh, so this has been an answer uh, to the new refugee migrant families that uh, arrived during the 1980s. Um, when you know the first Cambodian uh, Vietnamese group started arriving in the uh, in southeast Minnesota, um, so when you're talking about um, new immigrant families, all that all that trauma, all, everything that uh, Dr. Yenka was uh, speaking, it's true. In 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 most of the services that we provide are also to wrap up to wrap around these needs. So we have um, you know, family service access, which actually work with most of the refugee migrant um, and asylum seekers to help with help them in the process of finding employment or you know, any kinds of needs around that. Or health access, uh, we have community health workers and mentor navigators to um, actually you know, work around that need and also um, interpreters and translators who are much needed. You know, when you're talking about, uh, you know, the whole process of acculturation and the experience of the, uh, it itself brings in a lot of trauma. So it starts right from their home country, most of them uh, with, you know, can be civil war or it can be the whole experience in the refugee camps. And then you come here with the whole, uh, the barriers like language barrier, cultural barrier. On top of that, there are a lot of social, um, you know, social uh, disparity that comes all of a sudden when they come here, and, and the, the the change in the uh, the gender, uh, that the whole uh, the dichotomy of you know in two different places. So in the, all these affect their life in general. And which, and, and I being in the victim services at IMA is able to connect them with, uh, you know, bilingual advocacy and all the resources that are around in this area. So that's, that's as, as, a, um, as a victim advocate at IMA, that's been my uh, role. And as an immigrant from India, um, I came in with, a, with an H4 visa, which is a dependent visa. And even that name the dependent visa, it's it's kind of like making you lose your confidence and self-esteem. And I think that goes for most of the people who are, I mean, even for me, when you are here legally with, along with a family who, who is, who has, a, who the partner is working, but you are dependent on the whole situation. So, I can imagine how it would be when you have all kinds of barriers on top of that, the trauma that, uh, uh, you know, that comes in with um, the situation. Uh, so we are, uh, as we try to navigate through this, we partner with many other agencies uh, in, so in Comstead County and also um, statewide. Nisha, what are the um, nationalities of the uh, primary groups that you are working with in Rochester? So, um, Sudanese population, uh, mostly, Af you know, African, Cambodian, uh, Viet Vietnamese. We, have, um, we used to have Bosnian, um, in, you know, refugees coming in. Um, also, uh, I mean, especially for victim services, I have a, a Spanish speaking population, a lot of um, um, Amharic, uh, Dinka, Anwak speaking population, um, Cambodian, Vietnamese, um, Somali. Arabic, Somali. Okay. Yep. okay, thank you. And um, Jean, I wonder if you could tell us from your own experience, how has the immigration experience or um, your experiences with immigrating, how has that stuck with you over time from your own experience? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, I would love also to thank uh, the organization for inviting me. And I um, also would love to mention my sister, Pela Ishime, who is a student at Luther College. Uh, she was the one who sent my reference. So I I'm glad that uh, um, today I'm sharing my story at the school where my sister went or my professor, the professor, my sister. So I got here uh, 
And that was January 29, uh, 2014, as an asylum seeker. I uh, remember that day at that time only had $107 and a suitcase. It's, um, it was a tough journey. I uh, didn't have family members in this country. Uh, remember, uh, I was assisted by churches, uh, by some uh, people from Congo, the Congo. I remember I used to have um, one meal every three days. It was a tough situation. And um, sometimes people think, you know what? Yes, you are in the United States. You know, everything is great. Everything is fine. You're going to be rich. You're going to have money. You're going to build houses. But, uh, you know, as asylum seekers, uh, you, many of you know that you cannot work without a work permit. Uh, it's, it's a journey. It's a process when you apply, you submit your asylum, you wait for the interview. And um, uh, after you get approved as a asylum seeker, that's when you're allowed to work. Uh, so it was not hard for me at that time uh, because after submitting my uh, asylum, I got it in two months. So January, 2015, I started working as a caregiver. Uh, I used to work for two full-time jobs as a caregiver and I also used to volunteer uh, as an interpreter and a case manager um, with the community, uh, Catholic Community Services in Tucson, Arizona. I used also to work as an interpreter for uh, Language Line Solutions. Uh, those companies, they assist refugees and uh, asylum seekers. So personally speaking with uh, trauma about being you know, an asylum seeker, I strongly believe that the life, the journey of being asylum seeker is a trauma itself. Uh, because as asylum seekers, we have those stories uh, where you escape, you know, your home country, you immigrate to the United States, and uh, you have to uh, learn the language. English is my fifth language. Uh, I have to learn the, the you know, uh, the way of life in this country. And um, with $187, I couldn't even rent an apartment. I did have to wait for two years to have my own apartment. Uh, my wife joined me a year later at that time and we started working you know trying to go back to school because i believe as nelson mandela said that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world so uh, speaking about that too i remember uh, one of the schools where i tried to apply in arizona they denied my application because where i'm from i remember that by told me you know what you're from burundi and uh, he, he googled it in my country and he told me small country, you know, the poorest country in the world. You cannot, you know, have an admission here. Try, you know, with another school. I was very sad and I went to a community college in my uh, town. And uh, I remember uh, the end of on my graduation, I was a commencement speaker and my speech was one of the top 10 the country in 2018. And I was the only student of speech. Uh, most of the speakers were famous athletes, uh, such as late Cheris Guzman, uh, Amber, uh, Amber, the former uh, women's soccer. Uh, we had the, the president of Liberia, the former president of Liberia. So I, 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 that kind of was the beginning of my life, my journey. So my goal was to go back to school. I remember I tried to apply for a scholarship. I was involved with my school and I couldn't get even get like $1 to go to school. So I remember all my savings for two years, I invested money into my master's degree. So I'm glad and proud to say that I pay my master's degree for myself without using a loan, without applying for any scholarship. And I'm proud to say that because this country, personally speaking, it's a, it gives opportunities to anybody coming to this country. I always believe that whenever when you follow the law and you believe in yourself, you have a clear vision, you can achieve your own purpose. So speaking about that, yes, trauma, uh, you know, for instance, the last time I saw my mom was March, 2013. So it'd be now eight years without seeing my mom. It's, it's tough, it's difficult, but uh, I learned through this journey that, you know, uh, having faith in God, resilience, hard work, always paid off. And thank you for that reminder that, um... Not for us not to just focus on trauma, but also to remember the resilience that comes along with it. Um, and that as professionals, um, we can help people find that resilience. And I wonder, Dr. Yinka, in your work, how do you help people um, move from trauma to resilience or, or uh, activate 
the resilience that helps them overcome the traumatic experiences that they have had. You know, just listening to what Jean Steve just said is so, you know, just speaks so much to the power of what our clients have been through. There have been a lot of um there's been a lot of anti-immigrant rhetoric that's war that's warned us that these immigrants are coming, they're gonna steal our jobs, they're gonna steal our services, they're gonna bring crime, they're gonna bring disease and just sully these beautiful shores. Yet you know, having heard this repeatedly, I can attest to the fact that the human beings, the people we serve in our program, they come fearing for their lives. They come in search of safety. Many have suffered obvious physical trauma to their bodies, emotional distress, you know, depression, PTSD, complicated, you know, grief. Um, they, and as we've said, they come having experienced all these distresses coming here for safety. Uh, and when they get here, there are more hurdles. It's, it's not just, you know, a walk on easy street. There is a new culture, new language, endless separation from families. I mean, you want hectic, come to New York City, come to Bellevue Hospital. You know, there you see chaos under, under any given day. Um, but yet people are rebuilding their lives from zero. And then I just kind of want to throw in before I get to your question, Professor Susan, you throw in COVID-19 that we're all struggling with, right? So on top of that, with no documents, no work permit, you know, food and housing insecurity, diminished income and resources, under and unappreciated working conditions, lengthy waits for asylum processing, you know, John Steve was fortunate. He actually, he got his relatively soon. Now, the wait is even longer. So I have people, clients, patients that I have worked with who have been waiting for seven years plus for their papers. So within our setting, we are looking, we are working with people, you know, their resilience, what has got them through, whether it's their faith, whether it's whatever skills, helping them rebuild those, rebuilding their own inner strength, helping connect them to services, connect them to communities, connect them to other people. All of these things within our setting, you know, and then you add in the medical, the language skills, the social, the social support services. We draw on all these resources to help people rebuild their lives. Thank you. And uh, Nisha, I was wondering, um, in in our area, I know that your program works with victims of trafficking, and I wondered um, what does that look like in our region? What are the types of issues that you're dealing with um, that fall under the category of trafficking? So, um, so when you when we talk about trafficking, usually. It's the sex trafficking that comes to most people's mind. Um, but there is a category called labor trafficking. And, um, and specifically at, uh, for IMAA, we usually get refer uh, referrals for international labor trafficking victims because just because that we, we have the capacity to serve, um, you know, help uh, people from different languages with bilingual advocacy and all that. So most of the time, um, when we uh, meet with the victims from international uh, who falls into that, the journey is, uh, the, the first step would just might be to identify their culture and language. You know, when the law enforcement reaches out or from the, or the women's shelter reaches out, to, you know, letting us know that someone has escaped from their so-called owner, uh, the first step would just be to identify their culture and provide with their cultural needs, you know. Um, forget about, you know, talking about their documents. You just starting from the basics because they're, you know, you're talking about uh, people who have been, you, you know, brought into this situation using force or fraud or coercion. Uh, and, and they could have been in different, in a situation where, they had to work 24 seven in 
in uh, very in, in unhygienic conditions or even uh, not getting paid or being threatened uh, with the family members who are back in their country. So with all, so we are just for, in the initial stage will be just supporting them with their cultural needs and providing them with the uh, understanding their story. And from there we are, we try to identify the basic needs leading and then the next step will be, hey, what about the documents? Where are your passports? So then we'll start with the passport retrieval because most of the time it will be with the owner of the, the so-called owners or the employers. So we may have to go in with a law enforcement or try to find some other means to get their passport. And, and sometimes, the, the you know that that would help us to determine the uh, legal status. You know, again, we to reach out to the immigration lawyer. So it's now you're talking about this long process. Exactly what Dr. Inka was talking about. You know, it can be from two to six, or you know, the 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 the, the process can be long. Uh, luckily for some uh, for some of our labor trafficking victims specifically, because we we were seeking and seeking uh, the more rigorous in pursuing the T visa. And we worked uh, very hard with um, the advocates of human rights um, at, in the Twin Cities. Uh, most of them, it was like a two to two and a half years, we were able to process their T visa. So in between that process, you know, most of them are ready to work. They're ready to contribute back to this community, uh, but due to the language, due to the, the reason that they don't have the work permit, uh, maybe it's just, you know, trying to understand what's happening around this. Suddenly there's a lot of things uh, changing in their situation and they just, they may just need to find a place to just sit and relax. Uh, so it's, it, it's, you, when we are working with such an individual, it is not as, uh, not about one year or one and a half years. You're talking about two, two and a half years of you know intense uh, service. And IMA uh, victim services, we partner with other like, uh, safe harbor or advocates of human rights at the shelter, and also the whole. Uh, uh, we reach out to various other supportive services so that we can, uh, you know, provide them with. Uh, with needed support at each and every step. And in some cases, we also have reached back to their home country to bring um, their family relative, the family members like their daughter. Um, there was one, there was one of my client who's, um, who hasn't seen their, his, uh, her daughter for almost uh, six to seven years. And so we, uh, you know, we tried hard to bring the daughter back to the country, you know, uh, in the process. So there's some beautiful success stories and beautiful life changing experiences for these individuals. But again, it's a long process and that itself is uh, a long haul. And I, I again, I, I say, Jean, you're, you're, you're really lucky. And I would say that um, having that motivation and having that resilience, it's, it, it, that actually is the uh, driving force. And, and when you see that in some of your clients, you know, you know that this is this, where this is going, you know, and, 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 and then you know that you don't have to do all that effort. You know, you don't, ha you don't have to work so hard because they themselves are, motivated and they also have that resiliency. So it's 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 different with each cases. Um, as a victim advocate, um, you know, my role is just to be there, provide them with whatever support they need in their journey. Thank you. And um, Jean gave us permission to either call him Jean or Jean. So um, <laughs> that he no answers problem. to both. Um, in your experience, you know, as we're thinking about ourselves as neighbors and community members, what were things that made a difference for you after ar arrival, things that you would want to encourage others uh, to be willing to reach out and help 
people within our own communities? What, what are things that are helpful for someone like yourself who is coming uh, as an asylum seeker to the US? How do we, how do we help people um, like yourself going through that process? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, this, is, this is a good question. It's a broad question too. Uh, first of all, times has changed. You know, I got my asylum in 2015. There was no COVID that time. And uh, personally speaking, with my experiences, it was very quick. But uh, I used to serve in a church where we had the asylum seekers and refugees. We heard testimony about people getting their asylum after eight years, 10 years. I also still have family members are still waiting to even have an interview after six years in the country. Uh, for asylum seekers coming to this country, uh, this is what I always share, uh, where I go, uh, wherever I go, especially young people coming here, it's to invest in education. It's very important. Uh, when people think about, talk about language, here in America, language is key. I remember the first week when I got here, we were invited to a meeting and with other asylum seekers, we were talking in our native language. And there was a lady who said, hey, he told us, hey, you are in the United States. Here, we use English. Wow. I was like, really? But that helps me to think about, yes, I've been speaking French, my native language for my entire life, but I have to invest to learn English. By doing what? By going to school. So the second thing I would love to uh, share with the uh, asylum seekers uh, is to never lose hope. Hope is the key of everything. You know, at times, yes, I know with COVID, I uh, have friends who have been waiting uh, a long time to get the interview scheduled because of COVID. But uh, in our DNA as refugee, we have resilience. We have uh, that spirit of never giving up. That's why um, when I was uh, even working as a caregiver, I didn't like the job, even if it's a good job. I wanted to go work at the university. I felt like I am in America. Yes, I, have, I pay rent, but I, I cannot lose hope and lose faith to achieve my dream. That's why I did everything by networking, by asking help, by going to school, by taking 101 English so that I can join a university. And uh, to the community, uh, what, who wants to help? I would love to suggest three things. The number one thing is to care. Care about refugees, care about immigrants. You know, here we're talking about people's lives, not only about papers or documents. We are talking about moms, we are talking about children, we're talking about men's life. So it's very important to care. I know there is a rhetoric against immigration, against asylum seekers. One day I um, told one of my people, people were asking about, you know what, yes, you went to school here, but you used our, our taxes. And I told them, you know what, first of all, I didn't pay for my school. Second of all, applying for financial aid as an asylum seeker, as a permanent resident, I was eligible for that, even if they didn't use that. So it's very important to care. The second thing is to learn. There are a lot of people who do not want to learn about the system. You know, the United States of America agrees and it laws support applying for asylum. Applying for asylum is a human right. So, and the last thing I want to share with you is to attend um, naturalization ceremony. You can imagine how when people get a US citizenship, how happy they are. There's listen to their stories, sharing their struggle, sharing their trauma and using the trauma to achieve, uh, you know, big things like education, family, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of things I believe in as refugees, even if we struggle, even if we have that scare in our life, even if we have that kind of issue and problems during our entire life and the entire process, we share resilience, we share success when we achieve our dreams. Thank you. And, you know, um, Dr. Yinka, I, there's been a theme here of waiting. And I wondered, uh, you know, whether it's waiting uh, for a, a refugee in order to be resettled somewhere or waiting uh, for the process of applying for asylum, um, waiting to be reunited with family. And I wondered from a psychological perspective, what 
what is the challenge of waiting? How does waiting relate to trauma? How do you see that play out in your work? So let me answer your question in, in a little bit of a roundabout way. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, there are over 80 million people displaced around the world. This translates to approximately, I've been told, every 20 seconds, every two seconds, somewhere in the world, a man, woman, child is forced to flee for their lives. Now, I'm highlighting this number because the, the, over the last decade, the number of forced migrants has risen exponentially, right? Over, of these 80 million, approximately four and a half are asylum seekers. And what is even more shocking about this number is that 40% of the world's forced migrants are children. They're under 18 years of age, right? And, and the crazy reality is even though we're talking about people getting to the US, majority of forced migrants go to the country next to them that's as unstable or as poor or even more or even poorer than they are right so only a tiny fraction actually make it to the west get here and so we've seen the numbers in the u.s uh over the years of refugees drop it's with with the last administration it's, it's there's a historic drop of over 80 percent right so when you talk about waiting and what it does the, the 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 loss it magnifies the loss loss of family loss of community loss of life loss of culture it magnifies and accentuates the loneliness the sense of isolation the depression the trauma and all of these are things that you know talk about that hope the clients that my colleagues and I work with we they dig deep and we help facilitate that, that bringing back that hope, that wanting to build their lives and reconnect and not sink into the despair of depression and loss. And, 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 and helping them also feel that there is a place at this American table for them as well. Right? And, and I think it's very, very important that, you know, for colleagues, friends, people, all of you who are here listening to us on this, on this, in the Zoom meeting, it, it's, it's so important that you understand that this is not a choice. No one, no one wants to be a forced migrant. No one wants to be a refugee. No one wants to be an asylum seeker. Most of the people I know that I've worked with, if they had their choice, if they could, they would be home in their countries, among their communities, with their people, speaking their language, doing what they do. It's, it's, it's out of um, the situation that has, that has arisen, that has led them to this place. Thank you. And can I ask a follow-up question? And this is the social worker in me. Um, to what extent does your program at Bellevue use peer support as part of your approaches to working with um, with your clients? One of the one of our what we're well known for is our group work. We do a lot of group treatment. So we have um, a francophone group, we have an anglophone group, we have an LGBTQ group, we have uh, a Tibetan group. Um, we have um, a group for new arrivals, an orientation group. We use a lot of group work where it's, it's about people coming together, supporting, sharing, hearing each other's stories, giving each other courage, giving each other inspiration, sharing information, as well as the individual work the, and the other things that we provide. But peer, hearing from other people, sharing with other people, who understand one's experience is is the key part of the healing process. Thank you. Yeah. And Nisha, my understanding is that IMAA also started as a kind of um, community support or um, 
it's in the name mutual assistance association but ways for refugees to help one another within their own community in what ways is that still part of the work of imaa yes um when when it was first started in 1984 that was uh, how it you know the 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 need of the hour was exactly that and and right now our staff um most of the staff more than i would say almost uh, 70 percentage of our staff um, is from refugee immigrant communities and our board is also 50 more than 50 percent of the board are from refugee immigrant communities uh, and so our working model is, um, of course, we connect with other service providers, but we always go back to the, in, you know, the ethnic group that each of us uh, represents. So to, so as to connect them with a, with a um, advocacy and support that is needed. So that that whole uh, access to their own culture and heritage, and it, it gives a lot of uh, support. Um, for the individual in their whole process. So, um, for example, you know, uh, some of the, uh, you know, some of the clients that I work with, um, the first step that I do probably is to connect them to find out, okay, which faith group are, do you belong to? Can I connect you with one of the churches? Or can I, can I connect you with one of the, you know, women support group that you would like to be part of? And do, do you want to have a language preference and you know if they so these are some of the questions that we ask and that's the first step that we do because i i uh, again uh reiterating what you said susan that's still our working model and th that's that's what we follow thank you and uh jean i wonder in your current work uh in a college setting and also in uh, as a speaker, how do you find that your sharing your story, working with college students resonates um, with people that you share it with? How, um, how do you kind of, I guess, pay it forward in a way at this point? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, I do work as an advisor and uh, in the Department of International Students. Uh, most of my students are those who came here uh, with the diplomas, but uh, who could not move forward maybe due to the immigration status, or maybe uh, who uh, just need information on how to move forward with education. Uh, you can imagine how uh, happy it makes me to connect with refugees or asylum seekers, asking how can I get my MBA? How can I get my degree? Or how can my child go to school? That's what I do every day. And um, I, real, I realized that most of those uh, students coming from outside this country, uh, yes, they struggle with the language, but they are very smart. So I, I can tell uh, the majority of those who are do help, they never fail, they don't fail their classes. What does it mean? Uh, our culture is refugee and or asylum seekers. The, 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 our historic background or our origin, where we're from, we have, most of, that, most of us are from countries with tough educational system, even if English is not used. What does it mean? It means that when we get a chance to prove what we know or what we get a chance in this country or a country like United States, which provides support, which value education, you can imagine how, uh, you know, students uh, are, um, impressed and uh, try to you know, get great uh, grades in order to move forward with their lives. And as a motivator, as a public speaker, most of the time when I share my story, uh, the goal behind the story, especially with the young immigrant refugees, uh, family is to motivate students to invest in education. That's how, that is my calling, is to show them that don't uh, feel, uh, don't feel underestimated because of your language, because you have like a bad accent, because maybe it's hard to pronounce your name. So invest in education is the key in this country. It's very important that uh, we uh, as asylum seekers and our uh, motivator speaker trying to connect with refugees and uh, immigrants to uh, 
push families to uh, send their kids to school. This is what happened. The majority of young people I met or uh, I've been invited to speak to, when they, uh, they finish college, the first thing to do is to buy the most expensive car. And buying an expensive car is not a bad, but the problem is when you buy a car of $30,000, with that loan, you cannot be going to school. You will, it's take maybe five, 10 years to be stable financially. So I try to help families, especially with young kids, you know, not only to focus on like, you know, getting expensive car, but putting, you know, resources, investment in education. Uh, for instance, you know, that now we have uh, um, the Secretary of uh, Interior, or sorry, the Secretary of Immigration, DHS, DHS, yes, Mallorcas. He came here as a, and, and, I mean, he was, a, his family was a, a, were asylum seekers, he was a refugee, and now he's a secretary of the United States. So what does it mean? When you invest in education, you build a life, you build a future for your family. So that's how personally I feel like connected, especially with young people, uh, that investing in a school, putting your strength and energy in getting to school, we improve our lives, we improve our family's life. Thank you. And I wanted to check in with Vanu or Charlene if there's uh, any questions that you wanna share with our panelists. Um, so we do have a question in the chat. I can read this out. Um, trying to find it. I can find it. Okay, thank you. We have a quite, I guess it's the time of the evening to open it up for question and answer. Uh, so just if you have some questions, feel free to drop it in the chat. We'll read what we do have. And also feel free to raise your hand and uh, we can and unmute yourself and we'll invite you in to ask questions as well of our panelists. Um, what we have in our chat right now, a question along with some context. This comes from one of our participants, Julie Fisher. Uh, and she writes, Jubilee Partner in Georgia specializes in helping refugees to resettle in the U.S. People actually go there to live in a community until they can go on their own. And the question is, are you, any of the panelists can take this, are you aware of other religious groups that do this full time? Kathy. Uh so in uh, Southeast Minnesota, we uh, Catholic charities are the one who does the resettlement process here. So they are the ones who usually uh, bring um, refugees here, and um, they do they do assist in the process for the first three months, the 90, 90 days period. Um, is that what? The, the I, the I think Jubilee Partners is a somewhat unique model where people um, are living in community, um, both a, a community of people who live in, is it, um, where in Georgia? I'm going to ask uh, Virgil if he remembers what community it is in, or Julie, do you remember? I think what it's community? down by America's. Isn't I was going to say America's yeah, Georgia, yeah. but then I was wondering if I was I think remembering it the right place. Yeah. Okay. Homer. Oh, was it Homer? Homer, Georgia. Comer. Comer. Okay. Comer, okay. C-L-M-E-R. Yeah. Um, All right. And then they resettle refugees who live there in the community. I think that's a fairly unique model. I don't personally know of other models like that. How about you, Dr. Yinka? I mean, I, I there was a place way back when in New Jersey and the name escapes me, but I will tell you, housing is always one of the biggest challenges. It's always something that people are looking for. And, you know, we're in New York, so New York, New Jersey, housing is hard to come by. And when you do come by it, it's ridiculously expensive. So it's always a big challenge. Yeah, we don't have any community models here. Again, housing has been a challenge. Um, yeah, may but I there are. May I ask another question, Charlene? Go for it, and then we yeah, also yeah. the question. It's related. It's related that. to this. Uh, Chris yeah. Kelly, who used to work uh, with us at the Peace and Justice Center, 
she had the idea that it would be uh, good to take old abandoned malls and turn them into uh, places where uh, refugees and immigrants could be housed. Um, I think that would be a win-win. I don't know if that's been suggested by anybody, but it's a thought. Thank you. I will say that part of the challenge at the moment is that the refugee resettlement system uh, has been somewhat dismantled over the last four years. And so refugee resettlement is not a system that can turn on a dime. There's what's uh, often referred to as a pipeline. And so there is a long process of identification and vetting of people before they um, are resettled in the US through the US refugee program. So it's, it's a program that the current administration has indicated uh, that they wanna increase resettlement of refugees, but it is likely to take a year or so to get that program, that system up and running in a way uh, that's more robust than at the moment. I will add to that, um, it sometimes seems like what we consider a refugee um, is what happens in other countries. So that when we have um, many people at our own border seeking help and protection that we somehow don't associate the term refugee with those populations when it's our own border as compared to having people seek protection at another country's border. So I guess I pose that as a challenge to us as Americans. Are we able to see Central Americans at our own Southern border as also refugees seeking protection? In, in Arizona? I, go ahead, Jean. Oh, I was going to share with you that in Arizona, we have a couple of uh, uh, programs. We have um, International Rescue Commission, IRC, uh, they do also help with the settlement. We have a uh, refugee focus, uh, I think, which is under Lutheran Church. We have also, yes, Catholic charity. And we have churches, uh, I know in Tucson, I used to live in Tucson. We have churches in Tucson, two churches, the Presbyterian Church uh, in Tucson. What they do for those who present, who came to, uh, who come to Arizona, asking for asylum, I know that they used to rent houses for that. I mean, the church members used to have like a pound to help uh, asylum seekers while they were waiting to get book permit. I also know uh, that Cross Church Methodist Night in Tucson, they do assist asylum seekers in the process to apply for asylum, to get the asylum and for free. They have lawyers, uh, they have, you know, everything to assist during the refugees during the uh, entire process to get asylum. But uh, IRC, Refugee Focus, and the Catholic Charity are the one who help uh, with the settlement. Uh, I would also like to add that, you know, you know, I have, uh, as a volunteer, I used to volunteer with Catholic Charities for almost six years. So when I go to receive a refugee family from the airport, uh, you know, the feeling of going to a rent, an apartment and putting the duffel bag down and getting that first bowl of pie is uh, such a relief for some of the families, most of all the families, I would say, because having a, a, a shelter to call them, to call their own, an apartment of their own, their own sofa, their own table, dining table, their own bedroom. It's, 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 a, uh, it's, it's a feeling that is beyond words. Um, and I, I, I think, um, and of course, the Catholic charities, they try to get all of these, you know, before the family comes in. And they make sure that all of these are, um, you know, well established before the families come in. And I, I put a link into the chat um, for the webpage of the Office of Refugee Resettlement. If you scroll down, there is a map 
And uh, you should be able to find refugee resettlement programs by state on that page. Dr. Yinka. I, I just wanna highlight one thing though, that we're talking about refugees. It goes back to what Professor Susan said at the beginning. Refugees are granted their legal status from their countries before they come here. The United States government has said, we acknowledge that you are refugees and we will let you come. And they arrive and they have access to certain benefits like housing, certain kind of helps. People who are asylum seekers or undocumented do not have any of these resources available to them. It is only once they are eventually granted asylum status that they can begin to tap into some of these things, but they don't have access to these things. So I, I, I just I just want to remind folks uh, of, of these differences because this can yeah. mean the difference between having resources, uh, feeling more comfortable, more settled, as opposed to where do I go? How do I feed myself? What do I use? Where, where do I lay my head at night? And, and, um, and to, to tie in with that, again, as a, um, as a victim advocate, I have seen situations where uh, women are trying to see, they're, they're trying to find the right time to get separated from their abusive partner because they are in the process of asylum. So maybe as a closing question. We actually have one more question that was okay. to uh, ask. Um, which is, uh, this was actually emailed in from Virgil, who I see is a participant also tonight. Uh, question for the panelists. What tips do you have for lawyers working with immigrants who have suffered trauma? And Virgil, I invite you to unmute yourself if there's a particular panelist you feel that, that you wish to have this answered or all could respond. I, I'm happy to go, Nisha. Did you want yeah, to how about, go? How about Dr. Yinka and then Nisha? So I will say, God, I could go on about that forever. Um, I, I would say really talk to the professional that you're working with, with the provider that you're working with. And I'm gonna kind of come at it from a mental health position. Um, educate yourself, you know, see that mental health professional as a partner, as an ally in the work that you're doing. You are a team for that client. Uh, let them know in advance, ask them what they can do. Are they gonna be a country, uh, sorry, are they gonna be um, uh, uh, an expert witness? or are they gonna be a fact witness for you? You wanna be clear on that. Um, do you, will you need an interpreter when working with this men mental health professional? Um, you know, you wanna talk with them about the reactions you're having to the information you might be getting. Um, you might wanna have them ex give you some psychoeducation. Like why, because often I get from attorneys that I'm working with, why won't this person just tell me their story? Just, they just won't open up. They they cry. I, I they start talking and then they cry. We get this also from judges too. So the, the psycho ed piece about how trauma impacts people, um, whether you know, just understand that there's such a ver variability in people's responses and their ability to process and talk about it. Preparing your client. You know, what is it going to be like to testify in immigration court? Many of, of the clients I work with have never been in, in, in court in their own countries. And this notion of I'm going to court is it's like, oh my God, I've done something terrible. So preparing them for it. And, and, you, and, and the last thing I'll say, because like I said, I could go on and on and on, is for you, the attorney, secondary trauma, vicarious trauma is real. I, I'm actually um, co-authoring a book with two others on immigration issues. Uh, for attorneys and for mental health providers um, when working in immigration court. Immigration attorneys don't often think about secondary trauma, or vicarious trauma. It's, it's not, and this is not to point fingers, but it's not your area. So this notion that hearing repeated stories or, or getting the details can affect me is often foreign. So 
being aware of that and, and doing what you can to take good care of yourself is, is also a key part of this work. And I'll stop at that for, for now on that topic. I think you covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most of the time, you know, when we are, when I'm with the, with the, with the client, to, you know, before the lawyer's meeting, you can really see them sweat, because uh, exactly what you have brought that, up. and there are many times when they have uh, stopped from sharing their story, and they, they no, I'm not going to pursue TVs. I mean, I'm talking about some of the trafficking cases or, you know, no, I'm not going to do this. So again, uh, what, again, I reiterate what um, Dr. Inka said, having that trauma care and, you know, and even giving that little bilingual piece of advocacy at that point is, will be, you know, will be a, a key factor there. Thank you. I was going to ask as a closing question if um, if, our, if there's anything our panelists would like to say to our listeners of some action to take, some way to be supportive. Um, what what should people do with this information that we've talked about tonight? Dr. Yinka, do you want to start us off? So yeah, I mean. Unless, as I said earlier on, you know, becoming a forced migrant, becoming a refugee and asylum seeker undocumented, it, it's, it's not a choice. People don't choose to do this. You listening to us, you have some choice here. And there are many ways in which you can engage in the issue. You could educate yourself about immigration policies and immigrant rights. Donate, 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 donate to legal services or immigrant services. Uh, organizations that provide services for this population. Volunteer. Uh, calling your local and state politicians. Hold them accountable. Protest. Connect with immigrant communities. Uh, people are in detention because they are here fleeing. Visit. Help them. Um, and just advocating for humane immigration reform. Those are my few. Thank you. Nisha or Jean? Something to add? Thank you. Um, always when I get a chance to uh, share my story, I always thank this country for giving me the opportunity, my the second chance. Uh, I struggled, came here with nothing. I have my family now here. I have a job. But I also would love to advocate and uh, to ask you to be part of this uh, fight. This country is a country of immigrants and it's a nation of laws. We need a system that reflects that reality. And we need partners. We need people who care about this, who understand that coming to this country, we sacrificed everything. I mentioned that the last time I saw my brothers and my mom, they're still alive, it's eight years ago. I'm investing in this country. I'm doing my best to make this country, my community better. But I want you to partner with me, to partner with uh, us, with this organization, to advocate for asylum seekers, especially for their right to be healed to get a chance to be heard by a judge. It's very important, personally speaking, that if it was not for that day in November, 2014, November 5th, I wouldn't be here. But I thank God that he opened the doors by using the, the government, by giving him the asylum. Last thing I would love to uh, ask, especially, uh, young student uh, is to volunteer, to volunteer with the organizations like the one who did invite us tonight, is to seek an opportunity to share or to help uh, those programs who did assist refugees. And uh, I always emphasize in this, 
when there is a chance to attend a naturalization ceremony, please go. Listen, hear those stories, those great stories about people coming to this country with now, without anything, but now after two or four or five years becoming doctors, professors, nurses, pastors, teachers. And again, thank you very much for having me. And God bless you. Nisha. You know, when, uh, when uh, refugees or asylum seekers or immigrants, when they come to this country, they have full faith and they also are patient, you know, when they, those are two qualities that uh, they, they, it's kind of a faith in the system, faith in the country and faith in the people. So I would request, I mean, all, of, all everybody to have the, you know, that faith in the reverse, you know, in, in the refugees, in the immigrants and in, have faith in them, have a little patience. You know, most of the time I see them, I see people struggling with the criminal cases or court system. Maybe it's just because they could not read a paper. They, maybe they couldn't understand the system. So just be patient. And if you see someone struggling with those kind of issues, just take five minutes to, uh, you know, sit by them or help them with the application form or just read those, you know, explain those words for them. Um, so some of the small steps that we can all take as individuals, and as both Dr. Yinka and Jean said, volunteer. I mean, I did not know anything about refugee, uh, refugee, the whole uh, the, the the whole process of refugee resettlement, or anything about asylum seeker when I came from India. I learned about it just by volunteering, and I, I try. I started identifying with them. You know, it, it's it's a big. It's a it's a great journey that you can take, and it's a, it's a, it's it, it, it's rewarding. And I'll say for myself that uh, thirty years ago, I got into refugee and immigrant work by working with Central American unaccompanied minors in Harlingen, Texas, and these are still uh, children and issues that we are dealing with 30 years later today. Uh, because I teach social welfare policy, I will also note that uh, there's a, there are bills at the federal level, the US Citizenship Act of 2021, which is a big immigration bill. And then there is, there's also a piecemeal approach in the American Dream and Promise Act and the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. So those are things you could uh, look into if you wanna follow up on a policy level. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists and turn things over for the last word to Charlene. Thank you, Susan. I want, I'll take a little bit of time to thank all of our uh, people who came this evening in attendance. And thank you, Susan, for moderating and our panelists, Dr. Yinka and John and Nisha, and also Vanalika for introing everyone. Also want to let all of you know that who may not know already, our Northeast Iowa Peace and Justice Center, we have an immigration working group that does many of the things that are brought up uh, in, the, in the event tonight. I just dropped a link to our uh, in the chat to that part of our website. Uh, feel free to look there and join us if you wish, or contact me. You can contact through our website too for any further questions uh, in the regard there. But that is one one of one of the many actually organizations within the Chikor area that are working and uh, helping our. Uh, immigrants and refugees and asylum seekers that have come to our area in the past and into the future. Um, but, and that is it. Again, thank you everyone for coming tonight. And uh, we will be following, one more thing I should say, we will be following up. We have an email of some resources and things that will, all of our participants uh, will receive and we'll be getting that sent out to you. And also this recording will be made available like I said at the beginning on our new oh, YouTube wonderful. channel uh, for any folks that you may know that were unable to attend tonight. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. And have a great evening. Thank you. And thank Thanks, you, everyone. Just one more time. <laughs> See thank you. you. See ya.